I love that. I love that song because that song means it's time for Ministry of the Arts. Hi, how are you? Cliff Gober here. Um, welcome to Ministry of the Arts. Uh, we have a very special show. They usually say that on sitcoms when they're about to do a serious topic but still try to get laughs, a very serious episode of. But this is a, uh, a special show. Uh, usually I have a guest or two. Uh, joining me today, we're going to do a best of show. Uh, we've got some clips from some guests that we've had in the past, and uh, it's going to be a very, very exciting time. I've been really blessed uh, to do this particular broadcast. If you've never seen it before, as they used to say, don't touch that dial, but that's old school. So now it's don't put your finger on that remote. Uh, uh, because we're going to have a great show. I've got four wonderful guests uh, that I've interviewed in the past. Uh, actually, three guests and one surprise that uh, I think you're going to enjoy very much. And we're just going to kick back. We're going to celebrate uh, Ministry of the Arts with our special guests. I want to say a great hello. God bless you. Love you, booby booby, to Dr. Tanya Lewis at the uh, West Angeles Church of God in Christ, who allows all of these broadcast to go forth. Also a very, very special big ups, respect, love to my pastor and my bishop, Bishop Charles Edward Blake. Uh, and we are endeavoring upon a brand new building project and everybody around the church is excited about it. So Bishop, we love you. We appreciate you. We're standing behind you. We got your back, sir. That means we support you um, in the new school hip hop language. Anyway, let me stop talking <laughs> before I get in trouble. Um, as I've said, we've got uh, three very special guests that I've interviewed from the past, and we're going to take a look at some of those clips and just revisit some of those great conversations that I've had. How blessed am I to be able to interview and talk to and have great conversations with wonderful Christian, godly people who are also artists? And that's how we look at it. We're godly people who are artists. We're not ar artists, artists before we're godly people. All right, our first uh, guest was, uh, is a good buddy of mine. His name is David Reddick, and uh, he is a writer, songwriter, actor, uh, artist. He designs chairs. He does paintings from different types of medium. Uh, just an all-around Renaissance man. We had a great conversation, and one of the things that we talked about as godly people was being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And he told a great story about how he was listening to the Spirit of God and how it led him from one part of his life into another part of, of his life that got him literally here to Los Angeles. Check this out. Just heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, David, go back to your blueprint. What is your blueprint? Because sometimes in life we begin to build on foundations and things like that and we begin to veer away from the blueprint. Right. Not that the engagement or anything prior to that was in vain, but I know had I stayed in Atlanta and had I gotten married then, my life would have taken on a completely totally different, di different so, course. So let's talk about this blueprint. One of the things that I admire about you is your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit to just kind of flow with where God directs you. So, so what was the blueprint? The blueprint for me has always been um, creativity. Um, I say songwriting is the carrot that has been dangled in front of me, mm. you know, because if, if music is speaking, um, God has gifted me so that I can write or I'll hear. I'm very passionate about songwriting and singing. But that gift of songwriting has put me in positions of leadership. Um, it's put me in positions where I've had to speak and things like that because it's, it's put me in positions of ministry, which is one of the things I was like, I'm not going to do. <laughs> I'm not do. My dad is a pastor. Okay, okay. And I know ministry. And, but, you know, God has a way of getting what he wants out of you. So, so the blueprint was basically just opening up to be creative? Opening up to kind of like when that happened, I always knew that I was, in fact, I, I, I didn't go to college like the traditional sense, like mm -hmm. I'm going to go and, and major in this. When I was 18, I, I almost didn't go to college because mm -hmm. I knew that I would be songwriting, um, that, I would, that I was a songwriter, mm -hmm. and that I would be singing. But my parents, thank God for wisdom and yeah, godly parents, that. was like, David, just go. Um, 
you know, get, get in good, um, further your education. And my model for my mom is one door will open up another door. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Morehouse College. That was the best decision that, um, that I could have learned. It taught me faith, taught me how to stand. And I got a great education out of it. Absolutely. But um, I kind of just went to become more of a well-rounded individual mm -hmm. and, and sharpen the ax, sharpen the tubes. But the blueprint has always been creatively it has been music mm -hmm. and so when things kind of um, I don't want to say fell apart but drastically shifted yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> when things drastically <laughs> shifted in my life I just remember just the Holy Spirit saying David what is your blueprint and just such a piece that a severe piece so mm -hmm. it was basically like a logical decision I was like okay it's music um, I've always wanted to do it. It's either going to be L.A. or New York. Okay. And so I prayed about it, submitted it to my parents, and got some go other godly counsel. But I knew that I was leaving Atlanta. Right. And so I prayed about it, and it was just either going to be New York or Los Angeles. And I'm from Chicago, and I was just like, I don't want to deal with the cold. I feel you, bro. And I on the surface, you. New York is like a fast-paced mm -hmm. type of thing. Mm -hmm. Me, my personality, I'm more laid back. Mm -hmm but it, just a quiet determination. Right, right. And I thought the blaseness of LA, everything laid back, right. would be more suited for me. But since I've been out here, um, even sometimes the casual decisions that we make, mm -hmm. God has, has had his hand on Absolutely. me. And so coming here to pursue music, um, which was the blueprint, I got out here and started writing, writing doors started opening up. And I'll never forget this. The Lord, I was sitting in service, and God said, David, you don't put any limits on me. I love taking risks. I mm. love, my motto was like, walk by faith, but use wisdom. <laughs> 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 because I love taking adventures and right, things like right, that. And he's right. like, David, you don't put any limits on me. Now don't put any limits on yourself. Mm. And I was like, wow, what does that mean? But I knew exactly what it meant. Mm. So, so often, as an artist, I would, um, people would say, well, just focus in on this or just do this. And that was like, okay, trying to put me right, in a box. Right, right, right. And once I got the permission and the confidence to take the limits off of seeing myself mm -hmm. one way and mm -hmm. starting to get a bigger picture of my purpose and mm -hmm. how God sees me, mm -hmm. I saw that um, not only was there a songwriter inside of me, but there was just a writer, period. Mm. Um, I discovered that there was an actor inside of me. I had done actor, you know, but kind of like the Karate Kid, wax on, right, wax right, off. Right, right. You don't see how things are clicking. Right. Um, and then... I love the Karate Kid reference, wax on, wax off. That's one of my favorite, favorite uh, references in that movie. David Reddick, he is just such a man who has a heart of God. He has a heart for God. Um, he's just a warm individual. I had no idea he was from Chicago. I'm from that area myself. And when we found out that we, when we, that we were from near the same area, there was another connection that he and I had. If you ever get to West Angeles, if you ever come to Los Angeles and you want to visit, come to West Angeles Church, there may be a Sunday where you end up seeing David up in the pulpit area. He's, he is one of our praise and worship leaders and he does a fantastic job. And it's just a wonderful lesson of how, when we allow God to lead us by his spirit, that doors open up, as David said, but also things that are in us are able to come out of us because we, we never knew. We, we never know all of the things that are in us, but God knows because he made us that way. So if you're watching and you, you have ideas or thoughts about doing creative endeavors or you're already doing creative endeavors, but there's something on the inside of you that's still feeling like it wants to come out, if you're already a godly person and, and you're walking by faith, spend some time with God. Let him talk to you. Get to a place where you can be quiet and you can listen to his voice and his direction. Uh, our, our pastor, Bishop Blake, always says that God protects where God directs and God provides where God guides. And so when we listen and hear and are obedient to where God wants to take us, he will both protect us and provide for the vision that he has in us. It's just a great guest. I, I, I love that guy dearly. Our next special guest was probably one of my first 
quote unquote celebrities that I've interviewed. Wonderful woman, her name is Elena Reed Hall. Most of you know her from the sitcom 227 uh, with Marla Gibbs. It, it aired for a long time. Um, I know her as that, but I also know her as the quiet lady in our crystal room dining area who sometimes feeds people as they come in for lunch and dinner. It was a wonderful interview. The lady is silly. We had a good time, and uh, she was talking specifically about when she did a Broadway production of Hair and the unique thing that happened um, uh, while she was on that production. <laughs> Take a look at this. Sang in Chicago in clubs for a while, and then I got into the production of Hair, mm. and that's how that's I started right. with my equity card. Right, that's right. So I did the hair thing for a while. Now the hair thing for for some people who may not be familiar with the show, there was some. How do we put this? Uh, nudity. Yeah, let's go with nudity. Let's just go with it. There was yes. some nudity, nudity in, in the, the show. show. <laughs> yes. Uh, just just before the. Um, End of the first act. Now, did you know that there was nudity before you got Absolutely. the show? Absolutely. Okay. And you okay with that? Absolutely. <laughs> so funny. I think I told this before when I did the other show that Tanya Lewis had. Right. Um, there's a woman. That, there was a woman at my church, mm -hmm. uh, at St. John Baptist Church, uh, who stopped my grandmother and said, um, Ruth. How can you let your daughter get up on stage and show her behind like that? Mm. And Mama looked at her and said, well, at least she's getting paid for it. There's some of y'all <laughs> out here doing it for free. <laughs> so once she was cool with that, right, and that right. was fun. And it was very artistic. Right, you know, right, blah, right, blah, blah. right. So, right. Um, so you did hair. Did hair. Got your equity got card. Got my equity card. Went on the road with it. Toured Europe and another show. And then I came to New York. Mm -hmm. And I did nightclub work, and um, then some PAs, production assistants, mm -hmm. saw me in the club and told the producers of Sesame Street, you should go down and hear this girl sing. She has a really great voice. Mm -hmm. They did put me on the show as a guest. Wow. I was in Australia doing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They called me up and asked me if I would like to be um, a regular. Hmm. Put the phone down, went in the other room, screamed, came back, and that's how I go. got on Sesame Street. This is an interesting transition because as you were talking, I was thinking about the different types of jobs that you've stated that you've had. And I know how disorienting it can be to go from one form of doing entertainment that you're comfortable with to another form where you have new people or new cities or new script or new whatever. How were you able to handle it? Was no was it no big deal to you, or was it exciting? Well, <clears throat> going from theater to television, mm -hmm. um, it was it was a transition because mm -hmm. in theater you talk with a very loud, strong voice. Right. And I'm always being like, "Lady, you don't talk so loud." But yeah, see, right. that's how I was trained. Right. 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 Uh, on television, you might have a microphone on like you have mm -hmm. here, and or some a boom over your head. Right. Right. Um, it was different, and learning how to look at the different cameras around mm -hmm. the room, mm -hmm. follow the red light, mm -hmm. and it's um, learning how to work without an audience sometimes. Right, right, right. But going back to the odd jobs, I worked in Bloomingdale's. Really? When I was doing theater and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. And I found, I worked in the fine jewelry department, and I found that it was like being on stage. Mm. How so? Well, you're performing. Uh, you know, I, I, I used to wear the jewelry. Okay. And so that always helped me sell the jewelry. Okay. And um, so it was like, you know, uh, my calendar was my own personal stage. Right, right. And it was how I presented myself uh, if I could, you know, get the most sales. There you go. Well, you know, you, you've worked a lot of different things and traveled all over the world. Has, was there any time that you actually felt discouraged, though? Because, you know, we hear about, well, such and such did this, and then a year later they were part of this. And, and what a lot of people don't understand is you don't necessarily know what the next job is. And exactly. you don't know it's going to be. You never know what, what, what's going to happen when the phone rings. So were there any times where you felt discouraged or just disappointed or you just knew this is what you were going to do no matter oh, what? Oh, no. I knew this is, well, actually, I, I didn't start out doing this. I started out being a brain surgeon. That was what I wanted to be, okay. a brain surgeon. Then I realized after when I turned six that, uh, <laughs> that wasn't going to, I didn't, you know. 
surgery wasn't going to uh, necessarily make people happy. Right. That was my main <laughs> goal. Was, I thought if I operated on people's brains, I could make them happy. So um, I decided to be a shrink. That's okay. what I was planning to be when I got to, to college. College arts, okay. But then somehow the Lord put me in a talent show for mm -hmm. the freshmen. Mm. And my being a freshman, there you, you go. know, go figure. And once you get a bite of that, that one that acting bug bites you. Well, I was standing on stage and I was singing a song and telling some jokes and everybody just seemed to be laughing. Yeah. And, and I said to myself, and this all went in my mind, just flashed in my mind. It says, now look at this. You can get to more people like this than having them come to your office one at a time. Right. And That's a great thing. You can reach more people entertaining than you could having someone come in one at a time. You know, a lot of times people, and, and well-meaning people, uh, make us feel that entertainment doesn't have any value. I was just talking with a friend of mine last night, as a matter of fact, and she was ha she's having a really rough time and God is taking her through uh, a tight, difficult season. And we were watching a game show and it was exciting and it was it was tense and it was fun and it was funny. And for a ha for an hour of her day, she was able to forget about her problems and her issues and she was able to laugh and she was able to relax. That's what we can do with artistic endeavors and how much more so when godly people are fueling what's going on both in front of and behind the camera. So don't allow anyone to, if you're watching, don't allow anyone to let you think that if you want to be an actor or an actress or a musician or a singer or a songwriter, that it has no value, that it has no meaning. It has a lot of meaning. If God has given you creativity, then the, 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 the purpose for that creativity is to share with maybe the world or your neighborhood or just your family at the family reunion. You know, maybe you can make Aunt Doris laugh because she's had a hard time for the last year and a half. You never know. 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 <laughs> you may end up on a show with me. <laughs> All right. I'm having more fun than the law allows. Our next guest, speaking of fun, uh, was an incredibly fun, enjoyable guest. Um, I have a lot of respect for this man. I was just speaking with someone about him uh, on yesterday, and I said, when I grow up, I want to be like him. He, he runs the West Angeles Theater, uh, the Theater Arts uh, Building, and uh, he books all of the shows. He has a gospel comedy slam. He has this. He has that. He's got a lot of different things, and he's been on Broadway, and he's been in movies, and he's been in film, and the boy is silly as he wants to be, but he's a great brother in the Lord. I appreciate him so much. His name is Marvin Wright Bay. And uh, he tells a very interesting story. Check this out. Now, a couple of things that you mentioned our audience may or may not be familiar with. Mm -hmm. One, I know who Doc Powell is. Sure. I know who Kirk Whalem is. I know who Ron Brown is. Mm -hmm. But for those who don't know, right. who, who are these guys? Oh, they're very fine and talented Christian musicians mm. and uh, very well known in the jazz community. John, I mean, I'm sorry, Doc is a jazz guitarist. Right. Uh, Kurt Whalem is a jazz saxophonist. Right. And uh, Ron Brown also is a jazz saxophonist. Right. So these guys have great ministries. Ron Brown does a lot of ministry work in Japan. Mm -hmm. In fact, he performed at our theater once and brought a 80-member Japanese choir, Christian wow. choir, on stage. Wow. Uh, Kurt Whalem has done numerous things at West Angeles, including uh, uh, recording one of his albums there. Right, right. And then, of course, Doc Powell is a member of West Angeles, and uh, he's been featured on many of Sundays and in various other events. And uh, one particular CD that he recorded, he recorded for the sole purpose of all the funds going to West Angeles Church of God in right. Christ now, for the was, building uh, fund. I've got the victory. Yeah. That's what was that. yeah. Now, here's an interesting story I heard, and I want to get into the Marvin stuff, but I want to ease you into it because okay. I know how comfortable you are talking about yourself. <laughs> but this is the story that I heard. Um, the live recording that Kirk Whalem did, yes. I believe is what it was, mm -hmm. and Doc was on it. Jonathan Butler, right. all these people. Well, Paul, Paul Jackson, Jackson Jr., Jr. Right. who at the time was a member of a different church, mm -hmm. was in rehearsals and working there at West Angeles and got so enamored with the way things were going at West Angeles, right. he became a member 
of our church. All right. Now, here's the thing you got to know about me, Doc Powell, and Paul Jackson Jr. Okay. I love those guys. Yes. I I can't tell you how huge a Paul Jackson Jr. fan I am. I understand. I mean, he is an amazing, amazing artist. Yes. So just the thing about how it is when when godly people carry themselves as godly people and artists. Yes. The impact that it has, mm -hmm. not only through their music, but through who they are as people. That's true. And and have you had a chance to see that from time to time? Uh, with regards to? With regards to the artist and how, how they impact people's lives as artists, not necessarily as performers. Well, I mean, as, as godly people and not well, there Well, there, there is definitely, um, I, I'd like to say that they're, they're one and the same, but mm -hmm. no... Oftentimes you encounter uh, a, um, a split between the two, mm. uh, them as the person and them as the artist. Okay. And so on any given day, you got to really know who you're dealing with, mm. <laughs> okay? Because okay. okay. sometimes the artist has uh, 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 different demands than them than as the, the person. person. Okay. And so, you know, they, they could be this very warm, kind, and giving person, mm -hmm. you know, and member of the church. Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side as the artist, you know, because they are plugged into perfection, right. then right. the demands get high. Okay. And so you got to know who you're dealing with from moment right. to moment, right. you know. Right. But right. all in all, on either side of the fence, uh, I've never had a problem with anybody, the artist. You or, know, the or the person, you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank God, you know what I mean? You well, know? congratulations on the 10-year anniversary. Thank you. Thank congratulations you very much. on the success of the concert. All right. Um, uh, congratulations on, what was the other thing? The Your birthday. birthday. Happy yeah. belated birthday. Thank you very much. Very cool stuff. All right, Thank while you. we're on that, mm -hmm. uh, we were talking in the green room, talking a little bit about Marvin and how he got started. So, So how did you go from... Being this guy from Cleveland, Ohio, mm -hmm. from that to this guy that's an actor um, and also managing a theater. How did that happen? How did you go from Marvin the guy to Marvin the actor? Let's just deal with oh, that. Oh, Marvin the guy to Marvin the actor. Uh, well, I, I guess for the most part, like um, uh, most children growing up, uh, we do a lot of acting out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, somewhere along the line, somebody... And tries to plug you into the fact that that might be worth something. Mm -hmm. um, growing up as a kid watching television, I didn't know that that was a profession. Really? I had no idea that those folks that I saw in that little box got paid to do what they did. <laughs> and so it was just, who are they? How did they get this job? Or whatever it is they're doing, how are they selected? Didn't know. Right. Um, but I, I ended up being very active in elementary, junior high, and senior high school. Uh, in plays mm -hmm. and things of that nature mm -hmm. because of the suggestion of English teachers mm -hmm. and I uh, wrote my very first play as a senior in high school and was approached by a television personality to see whether or not I had ever considered a, a career in television. I said, for what? <laughs> you know, and he said, to do what you're doing and to get paid at it. And unfortunately, I couldn't take advantage of it because I was already enlisted to go to the Marine Corps. Well, I tell you, you never know. Marvin had a great story. He had to go to the Marines. Then after the Marines came back and was still able to pursue uh, his artistic endeavors. And those musicians that we talked about, I, I think I've got two or three of those CDs in my car now that I listen to. And I've had a chance to bring Doc Powell on the show. And psh, man, what a time that was. That was very exciting. Now, the surprise, those are all the regular guests. Now the surprise, I got the script kind of flipped on me one day. Uh, Jay Michaels is a buddy of mine. He works a, a local radio station here in Los Angeles. You can hear him usually on the weekends. And uh, he wanted to get into some TV and doing some interviewing and that type of thing. So he asked, could he interview me on my own show, which was very interesting. Check this out. Your, 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 when did you know that there was some special gift you had, something that was special? You know, we all had these, when we feel there's a sense, something different about us. You know, man, there's a, there's a, there's a phrase that has gotten me into uh, a lot of different things, and the phrase is, I can do that. Okay. And I remember just many times, ah, I did a play in the sixth grade. We did a production of Heidi, and I was Peter the Goat Boy. And my friends never let me <laughs> live that down. But it was something that I enjoyed. And when I was younger than that, you know, for Easter and Christmas at the churches, you have your, your Easter speech and your Christmas speech. And my dad was the director of the, the male chorus. Okay. And so from time to time, since I enjoy singing, 
I used to like, he would let me from time to time stand in with the guys and sing with the male chorus. And, and I'd just always been comfortable being in front of, of people. So I, I guess it started back then. But I never thought that I would be doing this, you know. Well, speaking of starting, you started from your humble beginnings. Humble of beginnings. Gary, Indiana. Yes, sir. Gary, Indiana. Yes, sir. And I, you know, we, I tease Cliff uh, <laughs> all the time. Every time I email him, Mercy leave messages see. on his uh, <laughs> cell phone. I can't go without using one. I, I think I probably use every Jackson family in, in each email. Uh, no, really, though. Gary, Indiana, I mean, that's a special place. It's I mean, a very not only special is your home, but you know, how was that? You grew up in Gary? Yeah, I tell you, man, growing up in Gary, Indiana in the 60s and 70s, I don't know if, if it could get any better than that for a black person because at that particular time, I think in 1968, Richard Hatcher was right. the mayor. He was the first African-American mayor in the United States. So, Gary, it was a combination of many black people moving up from the south, mm -hmm. working in the steel mills. So you had unskilled labor making a good living, 16, 17, 18 dollars an hour wow. in the 60s and 70s. So people could buy homes, uh, businesses were flourishing. It was a fantastic place to grow up. Sports was the rule of the day. Okay. You know, being from Indiana, basketball was huge, but football was just as huge. Uh, we had six high schools uh, in Gary. Uh, four of them were predominantly black and the rivalries were amazing, okay. and, and the history of people who lived there. I mean, my father was born in Gary, grew up in the projects, and most of the black people lived in that general midtown area. So you had generations of people. Gary, Indiana, baby, my hometown. G.I., we know how to do it. That guy was kind of good interviewing who he was interviewing. That was me. That was I tell you, this television thing is kind of trippy, but it's a lot of fun. Thank you. This was our show. How was that? Was that cool? Did you enjoy that? I, I really enjoy these looking back because I never look at my own show. So this is the only time I have to look at myself on television, and it's kind of weird. But, you know, you do what you do to pass the time. Anyway, I want to thank all of my guests, uh, uh, Jay Michaels and, and Marvin Wright Bay and David Reddick and Elena Reed Hall and all of the people who have come and graced their presence on this stage. I appreciate you so, so very much. We're going to have a lot more shows coming up with a lot new guests. It's going to be a fantastic thing. Thanks to Dr. Lewis. Thanks to Bishop Blake. See you next time. If you like what you saw, call, email. Tell all your friends about Ministry of the Arts. Lady D, I love you, girl. Thank you for your help. I'll see you next time.